I did take some liberties with the title because originally it said um, immersion programs uh, for a community with very few speakers. But um, ours isn't an immersion program, so um, that's the first, the first difference. Now, before I get into what, we, what we've done with our tribal school, which has a, a big language component, I need to set it up. And, and you need, I think you should know a little bit about my tribe and, and who I am, who we are, uh, as Pechanga Luceno Indians. So I put this slide up yesterday, but in a different context. Of course, we're in Southern California, and if you can see this, I don't, I don't know if you can. Um, yeah, it doesn't want to do that. Inside, the, there's a, a blue, like, kidney-shaped thing right in the center of that, and that's, uh, that includes a significant chunk of Southern California, Southwest Riverside County, North San Diego County, along the coast from Encinitas, Carlsbad, Carlsbad on the south, to San Clemente on the north, it includes communities like Oceanside, uh, the beachfront of Camp Pendleton, Marine Corps Base, uh, all the way north to Corona, uh, and the 91 Freeway, Riverside, uh, on east to Palomar Mountain, um, and everything in between, uh, Palomar down to Escondido. Um, it's, it's a big chunk of inland Southern California. What, what is significant, because we all have very unique things that happen in our histories, uh, one of the things that really defines us Luceno people, and certainly at Pechanga, uh, is what I alluded to yesterday, uh, the eviction from our village at Temecu. Uh, of course, the, we believe that the world began at, at, in this valley that we live in even today. And when the world was created there, uh, the Sky Father and the Earth Mother uh, gave birth to the Kamalam, the first the first of all living things. And the birth took place uh, right there in the valley at this place, and they had the name of Echva Temeku, Echva Temeku. And um, the name is actually somewhat preserved in, in, in the name of the valley being Temecula, Temecula, which is what the Spanish called it because they couldn't say Temecunga, our locational form for Temecu, Temecunga. So that's long a long reach back and and coming back into the 1870s um, what happened was beginning in 1869 actually uh, a couple fellows a guy named Domingo Pujol uh, and Francisco Zinhurdo they were sheep farmers um, they were able to somehow get the paper title to the land that our our village was on now, we thought we had that land because 25 years prior to that, um, there was a treaty that was signed, or, or our captains signed that, Temecula Treaty. It was the 17th of 18 treaties, in fact, that were negotiated up and down California. Uh, all, by the way, all 18 of those treaties went to the United States Senate at the same time, about two or three months after they were negotiated. And um, they found gold in Julian and they decided not to ratify those treaties, which is why we're not treaty tribes officially in California. Although we signed treaties fair and square, um, they, uh, they didn't ratify them. So they took our lands anyway uh, on a large scale. And so we were down to this last village at Temecu for a lot of reasons. <clears throat> One was you know, the disposition of land through legal title, and this was yet another episode. And up and down our valley, you know, there's two, two drainages, Murrieta Creek and Temecula River. And at the time, let me go back, to the right of this, um, to the right of that, uh, I don't know if you can see that bluff right there. This is a riverbed here. And in the 1800s and between, I, keep, I think up until 1930, uh, it was a, actually a free flowing river. And so our people lived on top of that bluff there. And that river, basically gave our people all they needed. There was all the willow brush there, they diverted the river, they had orchards and row crops, their sweat houses were down at the bottom, and it's jumping ahead. And so um, the eviction came though, uh, it was filed for uh, by these sheep farmers, and they went to San Francisco, they got a judge to, a federal judge, to issue a decree of ejectment. Uh, on all the people living in that village. 
And the decree actually, I don't have a copy of it, but the decree actually shows uh, uh, even some non-Indians that were living there as well that were you know, friends of uh, our people and stuff. They were named in, in, the eviction, in the eviction order. Our captains between 1873 and 1875 for almost two years fought um, the eviction order, tried they, they, going back and forth to federal court in Los Angeles, which at this point in time by horse and, and buggy was not an, an easy haul. It took uh, uh, two to three days to get there anyway. And um, it didn't matter. In 1875, um, eviction came that summer and a sheriff, w w Today we're part of Riverside County as of 1893, but this was in 1875. Sheriff Hunsaker of San Diego County uh, and some notables in that valley who are right there in that second bullet point, uh, came with rifles, guns, and ordered everyone to leave. And um, there was actually a, a, a few minutes of debate at that point. Should we leave? Should we get them? Should we try to get them? They have guns, we don't. What are we gonna do? And actually, uh, they were outnumbered, but, but it was mostly old folks and, um, and women and children because the men at, at that point in time were working different ranches. That's what they did. They did a lot of cowboy work, ranch work. So this was midday and the eviction team was there, the posse, and, um, and so they evicted them. They, they decided to uh, comply or else lose their lives. So what, they, what happened was they were hastily loaded onto these wagons and they were, they were allowed to grab whatever they could grab with their hands. Um, a few of the old folks were uh, put onto these wagons, uh, like flatbed wagons. The others had to walk and um, they herded everybody away from there just with whatever they could carry. Uh, they weren't allowed to haul anything in other words. But what I'm saying is most everything they had was left behind, including their livestock, their, you know. And up until that point, our people were very self-sustaining. That between that river, the stock, the, the, the stuff they grew for their own sustenance, they really didn't need anything from anybody. Uh, just needed to be left alone. But uh, that didn't happen. So children, people loaded on wagons. They went two miles and they were dumped dumped, the wagons were upended, and they tossed anybody who was sitting on them, just for good measure. Um, and by the time they got that two mile stretch down to where uh, they dumped them, which is actually on, on tribal land today now, we bought that land back, um, they turned around, they could see their village burning, so they torched the village, and then what they did was they seized all their livestock, their cattle, their horses, uh, their sheep, the, the Indian sheep, um, and they used, they, they sold uh, as, as much of that as they could to help pay for the cost of the eviction and the other side's court costs. So uh, that, that was the end of our stuff. Um, there, a few of the animals, of course, they couldn't sell, and this was a source of continuing trouble for the next seven years because that livestock, by the way, would, uh, they knew, the livestock knew its owners and they would go that two miles over the little hills, uh, across the next little valley to where our people had set up, you know, temporary villages at Tavishpa and Tuchana. And the stock would come to its original owners. And of course, once that happened, the original owners, you know, they'd try to shoot the animals away or give them back, but they'd get in trouble for rustling. And then they'd have to pay fines or they would get whipped. So that, that was just adding insult to injury. So there's another shot of, of our old village site. And you know, it's just, like I said yesterday, there's a Long John Silvers and Sports Authority. This, this is a business district now in the valley. And uh, uh, this is the parking lot. This is where our old cemetery is. That mountain right there in the western horizon there is the, uh, the site of the proposed aggregate mine I spoke of yesterday. And then, that's, that's what our village looks like on a USGS topo map. Um, this purple area is one of the ranchos that came out of the, uh, the Spanish missions that uh, uh, was, well, the rancho became the property of an individual. Um, our last village was on that, on that piece of land, evidently. And then this orangish color was yet another rancho 
There were three different ranchos, the Palpa Rancho, uh, Temecula Rancho, and the Little Temecula Rancho that all intersected right here. So this dotted line here shows the path that the, uh, the wagons took. And then our folks were dumped right over here on the edge of today's present, present reservation um, at a place called Tuchana and Tavishpa, two springs. And that, those springs and the acorns for the next seven years certainly kept our folks alive. A few people didn't make that journey and they went elsewhere into LA uh, or s north. So today, of course, I showed you this yesterday, you know, the dot, that dotted line is right here. Here's the old village. The old village sits under dozens of homes. Uh, but this is like 3,000 homes here, Red Hawk, Vale Ranch development. Rainbow Canyon development is a thousand homes right here. There's lots of people that, that live here in the valley. It does not look like it did then. And in 1930, the river stopped running because the owners of the cattle ranch there, Malin Vale, um, dammed up the river about three miles upstream to create Vale Lake uh, and, and actually set into motion a, a piece of federal litigation that still is unresolved today. We're party to it as a tribe. Um, it's just all kinds of repercussions from that. But this eviction, as you would imagine, uh, really defined my tribe's experience in history. So we were basically, I guess you would say, homeless, landless, without title to anything, um, just living alongside the hills there for seven years until uh, June 27th, 1882, Pres <coughs> President Chester, Chester Arthur signed an executive order that uh, created, the, the, by setting aside land, uh, the Pechanga Indian Reservation. And, and it was set inside a, a basically land that was considered worthless in 1882, and probably for the next 100 years it was land that was considered worthless, of course, because there was no running water on it. Uh, attempts at digging wells are futile, and um, uh, the only way our, our people lived during that time period was to live was to make access to a spring, artesian springs. But there's a couple other points here. Um, in this case, Pichanga, Pichanga is the name of the spring. It's back in our canyon today. That would that our people would haul water from there. That spring kept us alive till uh, the early 1970s when Indian Health Service brought some rollout aggregation. Uh, irrigation pipe and put that in the ground and called it a water system. So uh, that spring is very important. It's our namesake. So prior to the creation of the reservation in 1882, we were Temecula Lucenos. However, uh, from that date forward, we became the Pichanga Lucenos because that's our new place. That was our uh, new experience. And that's our identity, Pichanga Lucenos. There, and as I said, there are other bands of Lucenos. I'll show you that in a second. I also wanted to note this. During this time period, this, a lot of this stuff unfolded with the coming of Father Sarah, who established Mission San Diego de Alcala in 1769. And um, the mission that affected us uh, and, and the most was uh, Mission San Luis Rey. It's the namesake for Luceno. Uh, in San Luis Rey, I think it's San Luis Rey de Francia. That was established in 1798. Um, during the period of the Spanish Padres to the onset of California as a state, our population decreased by the thousands. Prior to 1769, uh, the studies had been done by um, um, some tr a few trusted, uh, uh, let's say, anthropologists. Uh, put our pre-contact, pre-history population, uh, pre-1769 population at uh, between 50 and 60,000 people. But by the 1900 census, uh, we were down to less than 2,000 people. And, and so that's, I don't know, about 120, 130 years. And, and a lot of that was through disease in the initial 40 years or so of the Spanish missions. Uh, especially the, the large villages on the coast, they were the most productive. They had the most varied food sources of acorn plus seafood and everything in between. And uh, their villages were, were 
large. An inland village, a nice large Indian vill uh, inland village in the valleys, in the interior, would have maybe 300 or so people in it, and that's a nice healthy population. A coastal village would be pushing a thousand. And there were several just right along the coast, and they were the first to go, and they went fast. So, Pichang I am, that's, that's who we are. Uh, it comes from the spring that, that provided us the water from the time the reservation was created in 1882. Pichang, Picha, uh, the verb is uh, Pechak, it means water's dripping. Uh, Pichak is the locational form of Pechak, and so at the place where water drips. And of course, the locational form of Pichanga uh, and Pichanga, you know, the Pichanga people, the people from that place, at the place where water drips people. And then Luceno, uh, over the last few, uh, let's say over the last decade and a half or so, more and more people are beginning to identify, finally, <laughs> away from the term Luceno. It'll be a while, but Payonka um, with you. That's all of us that are from these reservations, La Jolla, Rincon, Palma, Opala, San Luis Rey, we're, we're all one people ethnic, ethnically and linguistically, and so we're the Payom Kawachun. Like the Kawia people to our east are uh, Quim Kawachun, and the Serranos, and anybody to our north are Tumam Kawachun, and then the Kumiai to our south are Kicham Kawachun. So we call people by the direction that they're from. People of the north, the east, the south, and we're the people of the west. Um, there's our federally recognized name. And uh, also, Pechanga, we have 1,500 people today on 6,800 acres. Um, I think over the last 20 years, we've been able to buy back about 1,000 acres. So. so, the first thing after this that really changed our lives, because it seems like it's never over, uh, was the Paris Indian School. And uh, what I want to point out is that this began in 1892. So. These dates I've given you, an eviction in 1875, uh, reservation established with essentially no, raw, no water source except for Pechanga Spring in 1882, and then 10 years later, the Paris Indian School gets established and they start grabbing our kids and taking them up there. Now, Paris is 25, 30 miles to the north. It doesn't seem, in present day terms, you know, it's a half an hour car ride away from the res, <clears throat> but they were taking kids as young as five years old. Here's a shot of the Paris Indian School. These were all girls. I guess they lined them up in height order. And those are the uniforms. Um, the population of the Paris Indian School, which operated from 17, I mean from 1892 to 1904, um, was largely drawn from Southern California reservations. There's another shot there. Uh, the severe haircuts of the men and even the women. The Victorian uh, hair pulled back in a bun and the chastity look with the, you know, you're bundled up to your neck. Of course, there's, I can hear several grandmas saying that's the way it should be. So, why did that ever change? And you know, uh, in, in all seriousness, there's, there was a generation of our people anyway that that felt that some good came out, of, came out of this experience as well. So in 1904, Sherman Institute began operating, and, and it was really one and the same school at two different locations. So the, the operations at Paris ended. Uh, Sherman, it, you folks know where Sherman is? You probably have people from your residence that went to Sherman, no? Sherman is in Riverside, California. It's at a place in Riverside known as Arlington. It's still there, it's operated as a BIA high school and has been for the last few decades. Um, but in the early half of that last century, during this period, this was not a high school, this was an institute, this was a boarding school, and this was part of the uh, extermination policy, destroy the Indian, save the man policy of the federal government. And so part of destroying the tribal identity was to homogenize everybody, give everybody the same look. And so there you, you have it. There's been an attempt in the last 15 years. This is from a copy of a picture, and every, every person in that picture has a number. And um, it's harder now, but when this was started 15 years ago, there were some people, there were some 
elders of ours uh, that were still able to identify some of the folks there as their mom or their aunt or something. That picture, by the way, was taken around 1910. This is uh, probably around 1920 now, and uh, they don't look so depressed, although they don't look completely happy. A few look happy. Um, in fact, uh, it's a fascinating picture. We have several tribal members in here. Um, this woman here is the mother of one of the elders who's been working with uh, our language in, in our tribal school. That's uh, Francis Vasquez and, and her son, Raymond Vasquez Sr. Um, he's been one of the elders that's worked with our language program at the school. Um, I have a tribal councilman. That's his mother right there. I was wondering if they were working on a bluegrass or country band here, because I see guitars, mandolins, and then I think there's a band, yeah, there's a banjo right there. One banjo. Of course, it is country, right? Because they're Indians. So, um, boarding school operations then went from 1892 to 1946. For us, it was uh, 54 years of impact. And in 1946, Sherman changed their policy. They they stopped they stopped enrolling uh, students from uh, I'll use that term enrolling students. Uh, from California reservations, at least from Southern California, because um, I actually had an aunt who was looking forward by the 1940s to going to Sherman, because her siblings did in the 1920s. And uh, she was severely dejected when she was rejected, uh, because the policy changed in that year to allow only Navajos to go to Sherman. Um, I guess the federal policy shifted, so, uh, so somebody thought that it was a great idea that the Navajos should share in the benefits of Sherman education. And, um, and they did. And so uh, they, stopped, uh, they stopped letting folks into the school. And I think, you know, yesterday there was some discussion uh, briefly from the floor, some of the tactics that were employed that, uh, that, that were used to keep people from speaking their language at, at different schools. At Sherman, that was true, you know, washing mouths out with soap, punishing people. But there were also pretty benign tactics that were successful, like putting, you know, four to a room, putting a Luceno in there with a pomo, Miwok and a hoopa. Um, mutually unintelligible languages. Uh, forcing people to either learn one of those four languages or learn English. And uh, that, that policy persisted for quite some time, and, and from what I can tell from our folks at Pechanga, anyway, it was a pretty successful policy. So, in just 54 short years, thousands of years of speaking and thinking in our Luceno language, in the home, across generations of extended family members, our language was nearly extinguished through this process in 54 years, in spite of what had come before that. And so I say that the federal policy was mission accomplished by then. So that sets the stage for, you know, most of the last century of, of our people not learning the language um, and, and it quickly, quickly died out generation by generation. Now, in spite of that experience, our people began to value or see the value or the merit of um, education. And it was always, it seems like the kids were always being admonished, and I mean kids, I mean, I mean my own parents, were, were admonished to, uh, to get educated, to learn the system, uh, learn from these people, because that might be the only key to our survival. I mean, there were platitudes like that that were, that were said that didn't have a lot of meaning, but it was always said. And it became imprinted because it was said so much that it became a value. And um, let me just give you an example. By, by about 10 or 15 years ago, because of the premium that was put on even higher education, without any tribal resources, no casino money, um, our people on our own were able to uh, uh, a lot of us were able to go out and utilize, you know, uh, tribal scholarships and things like that, that that were available out in the public. 
At this point in time, we have five, five tribal members who are attorneys um, at various ages. We have one dentist, uh, UCLA Law School, um, three years ago, not law school, UCLA Dental School three years ago. We have uh, at least six credentialed school professionals, teachers, administrators, uh, three MBAs, and several CPAs, uh, accountants. Um, that's not an exhaustive list. That was what I could remember off the top of my head. So I take that as a lesson from the boarding school experience, that we're going to learn the system through education, adapt it to our, our needs, and use it to the, uh, the best interest of the tribe. Today, um, on our reservation, we have, uh, uh, we're very fortunate because of gaming to be able to do a number of things with education. We have a scholarship program for uh, anyone who wants to go to vocational school or a college. All I have to do is be ex uh, accepted and admitted. Uh, the scholarship is given to them, but they have to perform. If they fail to perform at a satisfactory or better, a C or better, for instance, um, the scholarship uh, turns into a loan which is repayable by the individual that received it. So there's, a, there's an incentive to not just take a, a college scholarship from the tribe and then go mess around. You have to actually perform and show that you're in school doing what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> and bottom line is there's the developed a common belief of the necessity of education to our common good, for the good of the band. And it's part of, I think, our new identity these days of being self-reliant. Uh, we have a real strong streak of, you know, we don't want the BIA in our business. The BIA tried to exterminate us as a tribe. They tried to exterminate us as a people. They didn't let us practice our dances for a period of time. They used our own people against us to try to accomplish these, these needs. We have a jailhouse on a reservation that was built around 1900. Uh, it operated for about 20 years or so. Maybe you have jailhouses too. Uh, the BIA came around and found somebody that would work with them, gave them a badge, and you know, once you get a badge, boy, you have the, th the power, absolute. And in that period between 1900 and, two, uh, and, and 1920 or so, they, that Indian policeman <clears throat> could throw you in jail for anything. If you needed cash on the weekend, he would throw you in because there were rumors that you were drinking. Uh, and you'd go in on a Friday night, you wouldn't come, in, come out until Monday morning. And, and that was the rule, that was the law. So we have, you know, I, I hear calls for, well, we should get the BIA to pay for this. Well, maybe. I'd like to see a congressional appropriation that leaves the BIA out of the equation, by the way, and maybe gives money directly to tribes. Because we don't need to be giving the, the BIA any more admin dollars to do anything. So that brings us to the present day Chamakilawash Pachanga School. Um, the school was created and it's operation right now. I'll, in, I'll get to what it looks like, but um, by composition anyway. Um, but we're took with them, I guess. Those kids got together in one of the charter years, I guess, about eight years ago, and decided they wanted to be the mountain lions, the took with them. And so that's their symbol right there. So um, I was asked to talk about this creation of this school and the language program. Well, really, an immersion program, which isn't an immersion program, but you'll see why in just a minute, I hope. And there was like four subject areas that tried to contain my thoughts here in putting this together. One was, what was the strategy in creating the program, the school? Who was involved in the initial phases and who's involved now? Uh, what are and what have been some of the key challenges? And what are the future goals and plans? So let's start with strategy. Let me let me cut to the chase here on, on strategy and simply say that there really wasn't a clear strategy because, you know, having said that, you know, there's a premium that Pachanga has put on education, um, nobody was really thinking in terms of we're going to have a school that teaches language and we're going to have instruction in our language in that school. Uh, so here's how things evolved. through through. I think the latter half of the 1990s, we established a daycare program. 
Uh, a lot of our people were working at the casino. They needed daycare, and uh, it was just a daycare, you know. People would come in the morning, they'd drop off their kids. Uh, the kids were kept occupied with activities. They were aged. I think there, was, there wasn't even really a teacher. It was like daycare people. And um, it was important, and it was all very good, and it met the needs of our people at the time. And then, of course, the tribal council. I've been on a tribal council, by the way, since 1992. And um, in 1995, we were, elect we were all elected to two-year terms, by the way. Um, in the month of July, we have elections. And um, the whole council is either turned over or, or elected, or you know, there, there's no staggered terms or anything like that. So. Potentially that happens, and in fact it did in 1987. There was a recall of the entire council and the tribal chairman for some internal politics. But we've been pretty stable since 1987. I should do that. Um, and so our, we, opened a, we opened the doors on our tribal gaming facility in a field in uh, 1995. And you know, that's what created the need for, uh, for daycare. But um, having been on the council, the daycare, I think this woman here was hired by us in, in 2001, and I'd like to take credit for that because, of course, we did hire her, but there was nothing visionary going on here. Uh, Joanne Luker was a spouse of one of our members of her council, Mark Luker, and um, she is non-tribal, although she is the mother of two tribal members today. Um, Joanne is very bright. Um, her mother was Mexican, is Mexican, her mother's still alive. And um, so she's actually very fluent in Spanish and there's been times over the years where she's, we've needed a translator, somebody to read and write in Spanish, she does that. But as education coordinator, uh, Joanne, during this period, the reason she was hired was we were implementing a lot of these education programs I was, I was starting to mention. The daycare program, she was overseeing, she wasn't running it, she was overseeing it. Uh, in addition to the scholarship and vocational schools uh, that our tribal members are, are, have available to them, um, there's tutoring programs like on, on the reservation as well as off reservation. There's like math tutors in town. Um, somebody has to track these students through admissions. They have to track them, their performance through a semester or quarter once they're there. She does that. Somebody needs to be a special resource contact for those kids, our kids in the public schools. Um, and this all fell on her shoulders. We, we needed somebody to implement this. And she was up to the challenge and she did this. So our impression from the council was things were running pretty good and um, with the daycare. But we didn't know is that she was starting to talk to other parents and see possibilities and hear about needs that, that were beginning to be out there. So what she did in the spring of 2002, is she recruited and then hired a tribal member named Bridget Barcelo to restructure daycare into preschool and pre-kindergarten. And that's Bridget right there. Bridget's a tribal member. And um, at the time, Bridget had been working as a first grade teacher uh, for an elementary school in the city of Pasadena. Cal Poly Pomona is in the city of Pomona, along Interstate 10. Uh, it's about 30 miles outside of Los Angeles. And so, um, Bridget, once she was hired in the spring, by that summer was pitching a program to the Tribal Council to expand daycare into a preschool. And of course the council said, okay, you know, what's it gonna cost, put together a budget, and all the due diligence was done, and we did. And so starting in the fall of 2002, uh, daycare morphed into a preschool. Now, in 2001, in the fall of 2001, we had this new building. I don't know if you've ever been to our tribal government center, but there's a wing in that tribal government center that was new at the time, and it was unoccupied. And it had three like big offices and a bathroom and even a little cafeteria. I think it was designed perhaps as possibly a daycare or a school. And so the proposal was to fill that space and utilize it for that purpose. So that's what it looks like today. And that's what it looked like 10 years ago. So the preschool's up and, up and running, and um, 
Gary Dubois is our cultural, cultural resources department uh, program director. And Gary has a two-year-old at this time, and she's in the preschool. And one day, he takes his daughter in there, and he sees Bridget working on some Indian words with his daughter and, and the other kids in the class. And he started thinking. Because Gary, about a year before that, had hired this guy, Eric Elliott, um, as a researcher, kind of just Pachanga's particular researcher. It's a linguist. He's a linguist. We had a lot, some linguistic needs. We had some recordings that needed to be translated, stuff like that. And he said, Derek, why don't you go have a look at this? Eric was teaching third grade uh, in the Chula Vista uh, School District down near San Diego. Eric it was married. He has two kids of his own. Um, Eric's wife is Mexican. Eric is very multilingual. In fact, the, the two books he's holding in his arm there are, are books that he's written. So what we have here is the genesis of our school today uh, that started as a daycare. Uh, on, the, on the left, you have Joanne, and she hires this teacher who's a tribal member uh, to come in and, and be the teacher for this Pachangas preschool. Independent of that, and uh, by the way, the council hired her. The council also hired Gary before her um, to work on cultural stuff. He answers to a cultural committee as well as a tribal council. And Gary independently hires the linguist. So this is like chocolate and peanut butter waiting to get together into a Reese's. Um, so th and the opportunity for that, you guys remember that commercial where the guy walks down the street with the chocolate and somebody's walking down with peanut butter and they bump into each other? That seems like kind of what happened. Gary walks into the classroom, sees Bridget attempting to teach in our language, and says, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we put this all together and see what happens? And that's what happened. Gary brought Eric over to check it out. He was wanting to see if there was some kind of a fit in terms of personality. Uh, and when he saw that there was, Gary assigned Eric to the school. And uh, so what would happen on a daily basis is that uh, the linguist would sit there with Bridget, you know, having been a school teacher, he, was, he took a year off, by the way, for this, uh, from third grade. He would translate everything at, in, in real time as Bridget was talking to the kids. And so it helped her learning, because she was independently learning uh, our language. And so, and, and Eric helped him, I think, formulate what kind of uh, curriculum needs that we, were, uh, that we were having. So they began also the development of activities and materials. Also key to this process, in talking with, uh, chatting with Diane o. Williams yesterday, um, uh, she, was, she was telling me that the Cochiti language is, has not been authorized to be written down uh, for, for reasons, their, their reasons. Uh, that bridge was crossed by our people in the late 1960s, uh, when this book was published um, an introduction to the Luceno language by Valana Hyde. And there were a lot of people back then that wanted to learn a language. Valana was an excellent teacher. Of, she wasn't a, a professional teacher, but she was just gifted to be able to teach. And I was able to spend about five or six years with Valana, and she's largely the one who taught me um, how, to, how to speak my language. And um, it was published by the Malky Museum Press in 1970. The UC San Diego Linguistics Department at the time under Ron Langaker and Margaret Langdon, uh, and graduate students Leanne Hitton, uh, Pam Monroe, and Susan Steele uh, worked on this project, which was published into the book. The book put forth an alphabet for our language, which made, it able, made us able to be able to write and at least preserve things in our language. Let's see, I'm waiting. There it is. I wanted to show you. There. In fact, Mrs. Hyde did so much for our language. I, I, want, I put this slide in there to, just to honor her. She was a wonderful person. She died in 1994. So that's Valana Hyde. And the other picture, that's her also, uh, probably 10 or 15 years prior. And those are her brothers. Um, Raymond Kalak on the left. I mean, that's Alex on the left, Ray's on the right. Um, and those are. Those are two of her brothers. She had a big family. Uh, she was born in 1902. All those guys were born around three years of each other. 
And they, they all were collaborators on the language book, the first language book. It was the first of its kind, you know, by having tribal collaborators work on a project like this. It just didn't come out of the linguistics department of some university. So tribal attitudes were very important. I'll just take a moment to explain this. You can see a theme develop where we feel like we've been stepped on through history and we get tired of it and we're able to try to do something about it. So we, we have developed this, this, maybe it's a value, maybe it's just an attitude of controlling our own destiny. Uh, we want to set the standards. Uh, consultants and experts follow our lead. Uh, we do this with attorneys in particular, uh, lobbyists, all consultants across the board. And we, we avoid ever having our consultants tell us what to do. I cringe when I see, especially in the political world, I see consultants um, or attorneys leading a tribe or tribal leadership around to decision making. And the worst is when tribal leaders have their lawyers sit at a table amongst tribal leaders in a forum and, and they're the ones speaking for the tribe. Anyway, I won't rant on that. So our initial st strategies for the Pechanga School as, as it was existing at this point in time then, uh, and this is with now teachers involved. Remember, our linguist is also an elementary school teacher. In fact, he wasn't a linguist until around this time. Linguistics was a hobby for him and he was very gifted uh, and, and during this time actually uh, finished his PhD. Um, and of course, our lead teacher, uh, Bridget, a tribal member, uh, was a first grade teacher in a public school. She now is inside our school. And these two folks are heading up the beginning of our school. And this was their goal, to teach stuff that's meaningful to the kids. And so the tactic was, flip that around, let the kids do what's meaningful to them. They grasp those things. In other words, don't force anything on the kids, because they're not going to get it if you do that. And I think those of you have, who have kids, who've been around kids, you know that. So after a year or so of, very, of a very in-the-moment experience with the school, and the goals and directions became clear. Here's a more refined part, uh, uh, goal statement to create a, a sacred and extraordinary space inside which it will be perfectly ordinary for children to hear, speak, and learn in Luceno. <clears throat> and then to train a core group of teaching staff, preferably indigenous, our people anyway, to speak and teach in Luceno on Indian land in a school funded and controlled by Indians. So the evolution of the preschool after a year or so, it became, oh, I, there's one more point. We turned to real people, real teachers, real speakers. We didn't turn to academicians. Uh, we didn't turn to uh, those linguists, by the way, that you know study linguistics for linguistics' sake, and you know they decline a vowel or a word to add infinitum to where nobody can make use of the word, and nobody ever uses those tenses. And then materials, curriculum materials, in the beginning were non-existent, of course. That first year, we zeroed in on colors, primary, secondary, and then everything else, and then size words big, medium, and small, and then basic shapes, line, curve, circle, and after the fact, and because we were flying by the seat of our pants, that first year we wrote up a little booklet that teaches the basic vocabulary we still use today. And I'm talking about our tribal Indian vocabulary. It was no accident that we started with the shapes, line, curve, and circle, because any letter of the Lusenian alphabet can be described in terms of a series of lines, curves, and, and circles. We have about 10 more books that we've developed since then for teaching teachers to teach in Luceno. But we didn't want to get boxed into just teaching children a few pat phrases like, how are you, how is your family? We didn't want and still don't want kids to simply repeat a few phrases in our language. We wanted them to be able to think in our Luceno language, which then channeled us into mathematics for two reasons. One, numbers are abstract and can be conceived of in any language. And two, we didn't want to make some parents jittery about not teaching their kids how to read, read and write in English. Math was an easy subject to win over. Parents <clears throat> win parents over because the symbols are international and it looks like you're actually teaching them something. And math is math whether you're teaching it in Tokyo or Moscow. So the symbols are the same. <clears throat> so with this initial success, 
Overall, the education quality was exceeding expectations. Language acquisition by the kids was actually surprising a lot of their parents and, and members of the community. And the initial and oldest group finished kindergarten and parents didn't want it to end. They liked what they saw in the kids. They didn't want it to come to an end. So the, the school leadership at the time prevailed on us to uh, add first grade. The council went ahead and, and I call it a risky decision because the people, we didn't quite understand whether the people were behind it or not, but the parents were and they were, they were a demanding and vocal group. They were very important. And, uh, and so we figured, okay, well, this is why we, this is why we do what we do. It's, we had about you know, 15 kids there that needed to go into first grade. They were ready, the curriculum was developed, it was ready, we had assurances. Uh, even though the concerns of matriculation, being able to move from kindergarten at the tribal school into first grade in a public school was a big concern uh, that we have to meet or exceed standards. So, we finally in 2004 in October, well before that, one key development also took place. We visited two schools, um, the Blackfeet School in Browning, Montana and Punana Leo Immersion School in Hilo, Hawaii. And I bring this up because the observations and the takeaways that, that came from these site visits were fundamentally important to how our school evolved and what it looks like today. First, the Blackfeet Immersion School. They liked what they saw, of course, but uh, Daryl Kipp admonished our group there. And I don't know Daryl, but he made a very big impression on the, our people that, that visited there. Gary, included Gary, Eric, and, and uh, Bridget. He says, don't build big school curriculum planning committees. They bog things down. He gave an example of a debate with their committee between uh, you, whether they should use the Blackfeet or Black, Blackfoot dialect for a certain word, and um, it was taking a long time to render that decision. He also said, when the community is swirling in politics, whatever the issue is, uh, just close your doors and teach. Don't get caught up in the vortex of politics. And he also said, you believe in what you're doing, go home and do what you're doing. It's working for you. And, and off they went. <laughs> so. And so these lessons were taken to heart, and they went to Hawaii. And so takeaway there in Hawaii is it's full immersion is not feasible for us, nor where we should be focusing. Uh, having seen that school in Hawaii, it became immediately clear that this was not the direction for Pechanga at the time. So that's why these two visits were very fruitful. And Hawaii basically was an example of what we didn't want to do, as wonderful as it was. <clears throat> so, in October of 2004, our school leadership, in conjunction with the Tribal Council, uh, brought the decision to authorize the official creation of the Pechanga School uh, to the form of our band's general council, the general membership of the tribe. And authors, they made a great presentation. Authorization was granted by the band and also to form an independent school board, which had actually just been a little committee up to that point. <clears throat> They authorized early childhood education, mommy and me, preschool, pre-K, and a K through five school, an elementary school. And the idea at the time was, okay, so now we have a first grade. Over the next few years, we're not gonna open, up. rather than that very moment opening up, you know, the rest of the grades two through five, each year they would add a grade instead. By the way, Cham uh, Makilawish, the root word is Mkilawish, uh, and um, you would add like nom kilawish, that's what's in front of me or what's ahead of me, meaning my future. Chama <clears throat> kilawish, that which is ahead of us, our future. And that's the name that was chosen for the school. Chama kilawish, our future. But we didn't have a principal. Uh, at that time that decision was made in October 2004, we had 54 students, 13, there's the breakdown, 13 first graders, 14 preschoolers, one teacher and at least one aide per class. The council did a search along, along with the school board. We were transitioning from control um, and hired a tribal member, Andrew Maciel Jr., whose credentials come from San Diego State, his undergrad and his master's, 
in school administration, interestingly enough. And uh, that's Andrew. That's what he looked like about three, four days ago. And so today, at this very moment, the Chamakalawa School has 125 students. And it's our largest enrollment yet. Last year, we had our midterm WASC accreditation visit. WASC is, I don't know if you know, it's one of the credentialing entities in the country, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. And uh, the program was, was received in excellence. It's like you guys are doing excellent. Um, currently, we have language teacher training in the mornings, in the summers for six to eight weeks, and all staff development days. Um, by the way, teachers are paid uh, a percentage above the prevailing wage uh, because of the extra work they have to learn uh, the language. And they have to learn enough to be able to teach the, uh, in the classroom. And I'll show you why that's important in just a sec. And also, the teachers take a benchmark test to ensure their proficiency of the language. Let me go over the mission statement as it exists right now at the school. And so this will explain to you why this is not an immersion school. It's the mission of the Pechanga School to nurture the children of this Native American community. By the way, this comes from uh, our accreditation application. Um, second bullet point, the best way to raise healthy children at Pechanga children who will be become productive, independent members of the Pechanga Indian Reservation, as well as the greater community, is to ensure that they are educated bilingually in Lucenio and English. This means that all subject areas of the curriculum must be taught in both Lucenio and English. Lucenio must not be taught as a subject matter, relegated to a few cultural minutes per day. And by the way, I think that's what they do in bilingual Spanish programs in, in California. They don't, the focus is not on the language or the culture. Instead, Luceno and English must be the very languages in which every subject matter, from math to writing to social studies, is taught. And that requires you to be able to work your language into, to adapt to new expressions that our people weren't using, which means that the language is living. So the Pechanga School uses an academically based, culturally appropriate curriculum which focuses on fulfilling California state content standards. Expected achievement levels have been aligned to the expectations of the local public school district. A balanced literacy approach using phonics, sight vocabulary, leveled reading, and the teaching of reading strategies is used to teach concepts in English and Lucenio. A variety of materials and strategies are used to to teach number concepts, problem solving in both English and Luceno. Science, social studies, arts, PE are interwoven throughout the curriculum. Actually, basket weaving is also there. And both Luceno and English are used as the languages of instruction. And both computer-based and teacher-administered assessments are taken regularly in order to observe progress toward California state standards, as well as, as tribally developed Luceno language and cultural standards. And what this has allowed us to do is to recruit any teacher who's willing to take on a challenge, this challenge. It's allowed us to recruit some of the, what we think are some of the best teachers that are either in the public schools or in the private schools that our people have been going to. And they have to come in and they have to, of course, agree to learn language, and to teach our language to students to a certain level. And that, that demands, there are different time demands. Their summers aren't free anymore. Uh, but they're paid for it. And let me take a minute just to note this, that during the time of this planning of a daycare through the travel school, the council was fairly stable and was comprised of these individuals, but I wanted to point this out. I was thinking about this last night, actually. That, um, I have a BA from UC Santa Barbara, the BA in political science. Um, at the time, Mark Luker, who was on the council, uh, was a, uh, a Bachelor of Science from U University of California, Riverside. Uh, it, it was chemistry. He was actually a chemistry high school teacher before he was on the council and was working for the tribe full time. And so he's a credential teacher. And he's the husband of uh, Joanne Luker. Uh, Andrew Maciel Sr. on our tribal council, uh, BA in history from UC Davis. And Russell Butch Murphy down at the bottom uh, from UC Riverside. He had his BA and he has I actually forgot to, I think it's a master's from UC San Diego, teaching credential uh, from San Diego State. So it was a very interesting, I don't know if we could have planned for this, 
all these attitudes about education, all these people being available and, and being part of what came together over the last 10 years at Pechanga to create what we have today. In some regards, I suppose it was the planning of the previous generation that set the groundwork for this, and that can't be discounted. Let me go through this last part pretty quick. The challenges are finding teachers and staff who believe that putting our language into the heads and hearts of children is feasible and can be fun for staff and children. Also, training the teachers is an ongoing process. Um, sometimes you think you get a really good teacher, they come in and then they decide, you know, hey, uh, I was a tenured teacher for 10 years out in the public school district and I'm a badass and I can really do stuff and I'm gonna do it my way and the principal's not gonna tell me what, what to do and certainly this linguist guy's not gonna tell me what to do either. Well, so, we weed those people out quickly when, when that shows, when they show up like that. Trying to make education a household value to some of our tribal families. In spite of having valued education, I mean, this isn't uniform across the board. Some parents don't have an ideal school experience. And so they have other values that take precedence over education for their kids. And they're not very good models of education behavior for the kids. And that particular challenge comes from our principal, by the way. It's what he sees daily and uh, would like to change. Teachers and curriculum keeping up with the pace of language acquisition. It's still surprising to everybody how quickly and just how much information our kids are absorbing. And you know, there's stuff that's being written that has to be created. We can't go to a, a school book supply and, and buy the Lucenio Math and Science book for fourth and fifth grades. You know, it has to be written and invented. So curriculum and materials development, especially for some of our advanced learners, keeping them challenged and engaged. And then there's been an ongoing pressure to expand the school into middle school, grades six through eight, as well as even into high school. However, there's no plans to do so, especially once the economy imploded and we entered a recession in 2007. Um, Revenues are, are tighter than they ever have been. However, you know, the commitment to keeping what we have right now is the highest priority. And then the development of, tri of a tribal language teacher corps. It's going slower than we thought it would. Uh, we have a couple tribal members that are dedicated and they are the core of our, of our group. Future goals are to create a self-sustaining, self-propagating school program meaning the graduates will return to teach at Chama Kilawish and other campuses perhaps in the future, uh, other reservations. Also, we need a permanent school site and facility, not in our government center, uh, speaking the language amongst family in the home. That is a lofty ideal and that's our, 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 our real goal. Creating a Luceno College that produces textbooks and curriculum for the schools. So it wouldn't be a college as you would think of, it would be a college for a very specific purpose. And then recruit more tribal members as teachers. Essential, essential factors for our success included, include our resources. We recognize, you know, I don't know, what was key to our success is having a stream of revenue available at the time and not having to rely on the BIA. Dedicated, having a dedicated core group of validators, people who, who largely the parents saying, you know what, this is working for our kids. They were cheerleaders. A supportive governing board like the tribal council and the school board. Initial school board was comprised of a bunch of parents, by the way. Belief in what you're doing. This is essential. Chemistry between the principal and the linguist. There's a mutual support that exists that without which I don't think we could be doing what we're doing because the curriculum materials are being written as we go along. And so when they're written, you know, they're sometimes pushed back from the teachers that say, I don't want this or that, and the principal can, can make that happen or, or make a change or make uh, steer changes uh, and get things on, on the right course. And then of course, there's some focus on the linguist. Um, and a, a, ling a, ling a linguist who is not an academician, but a linguist who, who believes that they are there to help a language survive, they're a tool, they don't need to be in the spotlight, they don't need to be publishing per se for the sake of publishing. 
So that's a big deal. Uh, there's another linguist like this. Her name's Leanne Hinton, uh, UC Berkeley, California. Uh, she's amazing too as an applied linguist. These people will go into the communities and do good work with Indians. And then the community itself. You can have a community that's ambivalent and doesn't really pay attention to stuff. Our community was not like this, especially with education. They were a voting citizenry, and they support education, and they support the school. And then finally, avoiding the political hoopla. Tell those, in fact, Bridget, our lead teacher, uh, I asked her for this presentation. I said, do you have any advice for folks who are attempting to do something like this? This is her quote. She says, tell those that are in direct contact with the kids that when the going gets rough politically, remind yourself that you are aligned with no one else but the language and the kids. Focus on the language and the kids. You know, you, you have a, the band is ripping it, itself apart over who's going to be elected and not, or some issue with the casino or whatever. This school focuses on the kids and the language. So, that's it. Thank you.